morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Looks like a great way to spend the day when it's raining outside. Good weather. Um, so yes, I'm going to be. My, my name is Andre Rain. I run the Kauai Endangered Seabird Recovery Project in Kauai in Hawaii, and I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the work that's being done in the Hauraki Gulf, um, the importance of the seabirds that are here, and how a lot of the work that's being carried out here is helping to shape um, work in places like Kauai and further afield. And I would like to apologize in advance if I massacre any uh, place names. I'm a Bermudian living in Hawaii, so you know my pronunciations may be a little off. Uh, so just to take a step back and just a little bit about myself, um, I come from the island of Bermuda originally. Uh, we have a very um, endangered seabird of our own, the Bermuda kahau. This is it. It's a beautiful bird. Um, it was actually thought to be extinct for over 100 years, um, courtesy of shipwreck victims and wild pigs and rats. And uh, it was rediscovered breeding on small little islets just off the coast of Bermuda. And um, conservation projects is where I started, um, you know, when I was a teenager working with these birds. And they're now up to uh, somewhere around 150 pairs. They've been doing really well. And 150 pairs is not a lot, but considering it was extinct, it is quite a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the parallels are there with a uh, bird that's breeding here in the uh, Hauraki Gulf, actually, the New Zealand storm petrel, which um, was thought to be extinct, has now been rediscovered breeding in some islands here in the, the Gulf. I then um, wandered around the world a little bit to places where there were no seabirds, like the Peruvian Amazon and Zambia, and then found myself in the Mediterranean, in the island of Malta, uh, where as part of my job is working with BirdLife Malta, I worked with the uh, European storm petrel, uh, Scopoli shearwater, which was Cori shearwater when I was working with it, and the Elkwin shearwater. And uh, now I've moved on to yet another island, because I can't seem to get away from islands, um, and I now work in Kauai. And I work on the three endangered seabirds that breed there. We have the Newell she Shearwater, it's on the top left, um, the Banrump Storm Petrel, and the Hawaiian Petrel. And courtesy of uh, human activity, um, as with other places around the world, our birds are now pushed back into the most remote parts of the island. We now find them in these sort of mist and shrouded mountains. And uh, the project is a, it's a state of Hawaii project um, in combination with the University of Hawaii. So for those of you who don't know where Kauai is, because I didn't until I took the job, um, <laughs> this is Hawaii, and there's Kauai. So we're on the main Hawaiian Islands, we're um, the, the most uh, westerly. And before I launch into work, um, talking about the Hauraki Gulf, I'll just give you a really quick flavor of what we do, um, because working in Hawaii isn't all about beaches and surfboards and palm trees. Um, this is our sites. So we have these remote areas. This is Upper Limahuli Preserve, where the seabirds breed. Uh, these sort of really awesome mist and shrouded mountains and jungles. It's another of our sites, North Bog. And uh, we get in and out of helicopters on a daily basis, which is always quite fun, choppering into remote uh, sites because all of our sites are helicopter access only these days. Um, working in the jungle in the dark as the birds are coming in, it's always very atmospheric and misty, um, putting tracking devices on in that case. And uh, we use equipment, which all of you guys are using here as well, things like these cameras on burrows, and I've seen some posters over there talking about that, um, which, you know, technology is a wonderful thing, and you get these amazing pictures of the birds and understand their behavior and the interactions with all the predators which, which feast upon them. Uh, acoustic monitoring devices, like that saw meter tucked away in the corner there. Um, everyone seems to be using those these days. And uh, we've taken that one step forward and actually deployed them via grappling hook from helicopters to get into more remote sites. Uh, tracking, a lot of tracking. That's a Hawaiian petrel I prepared last week. He's currently transmitting data for us on his routes in and out of the mountains. And we go all high tech on them with uh, radar and uh, things like these laser fences that we started experimenting with to stop birds colliding with power lines um, as they come in and out of the mountains. So. That's what we do, this is what you guys do, and this is obviously what we're all talking about. So the Horaki Gulf, um, I, was, I had the good fortune yesterday to be bobbing around on a, on a boat um, just out there by Haturu looking for New Zealand storm petrels. We didn't see any. Uh, we didn't see white-faced storm petrels pattering around. And uh, yeah, it's a really important area. And I had a look at that uh, report, which I guess, I don't know where it went now, but um, I mean, it's, it's over there for those of you who haven't seen it, um, the report by Chris Gaskin and Matt Rayner. And I had a little look at some of the information there. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive when you look at the site from an international perspective. So we got 27 seabird species breeding here, 59% of which New Zealand endemics. Uh, there are four species which breed here and nowhere else in the world. So, I mean, that tells you all you need to know about the international importance of the, the area. Uh, you know, 20% of the world's seabird species have been recorded in the Gulf, which is pretty impressive. 
And if you combine this with all these multiple predator-free islands and seabird conservation projects, which uh, you'll be hearing all about today, and all the world-class seabird research that's going on, you basically got a globally significant seabird biodiversity hotspot right on your doorstep. It's pretty amazing when you're sort of sitting in Auckland and you can just look out on this fantastic area, which is so important from an international perspective. Meet the stars of the show. I'm not going to talk about them too much because I don't actually work on them, and there's going to be specialists who do who will be able to tell you much more about them. But, you know, here's some of them. The New Zealand storm petrel, which I touched upon already. Cook's petrel, fluttering shearwater. The world's uh, breeding population of buller shearwater. And the black petrel. And these are breeding on only two islands in the Gulf, the black petrel, so it's pretty astounding. And there are challenging species to study. Um, you know, this is true around the world with dealing with um, particularly petrels and shearwaters, particularly rare petrels and shearwaters. Um, these are some photos. I, I was out on Haturu in February for a couple of weeks, um, working with black petrels and the New Zealand storm petrel and just seeing what work's being undertaken on these species. And, you know, they come in at night, so the sun's setting. It's beautiful, sun's setting, but then it goes dark, and that's when the birds are coming in. And then you've got to you know, figure out all the ways in which you can actually um, work with these birds and perhaps, in this case, catch them uh, using lights. Um, they're in these remote uh, mountainous areas in Haturu in particular, which always reminds me of Kauai. It looks exactly like a, a scene from Kauai. So the terrain, super challenging as well. How do you work on seabirds in an area like that? And then there are seabirds. It's in the name. They're seabirds. And they spend all their time at sea when they're out fishing. And so it's really hard to figure out where they are at sea and, and what, what are they doing out there. And of course, understanding what they're doing out there is key for helping their conservation. So they all face the same conservation issues that seabirds do around the world. These are photos from Hawaii, because that's where I work. But I mean, you could just literally superimpose your own photos from uh, the, the Gulf in here. Um, you know, unfortunately, we all find this all the time in our seabird colonies, predated birds. This is the wedge-tailed shearwater. Um, from beasts like these, the cat. Um, cat's a particularly big problem in Hawaii, and the same here. Same with rats. These animals are going in and out of seabird burrows. The seabirds have no defenses against them because they've evolved without them. Uh, changing habitats. In this case, this is ginger swar um, swamping a, a Hawaiian forest. You have all of your invasive plants here as well. And then all the things that, um, as well as introducing all these species, all of the threats that we provide the seabirds, like light attraction, when birds are fledging for the first time and heading out to sea and they get attracted to these lights and end up on the ground. Then they get eaten by cats. There's actually a cat lurking in the corner there. Um, or they get run over by cars. And lastly, and this is a, a particular problem where I come from, but it's a problem around the world, is also collisions with human structures uh, such as these power lines. And then there's the threats at sea. So, you know, harder to understand, but a whole range of them. Climate change can have a big impact on these birds. Overfishing, bycatch, marine pollution, plastics. And, you know, these threats are true whether you're a new shearwater flying around in the waters off Hawaii, whether you're a Scopoli shearwater flying around Malta, or a Cook's petrel in the Horaki Gulf. So, you know, similar species, similar challenges, similar threats. And this is where collaborations and partnerships are key. Um, particularly here, where you've got all this, uh, all this research going on, all this knowledge, um, it's all, um, really important that you share this information, which is what is happening, sharing it with other um, countries and people who are working on similar threats. As these bunnies are showing us, sharing is indeed caring. I looked for the cutest bunny photo I could find. There are quite a lot of them on the net. <laughs> so, there we go. Uh, so, predator control. Now, New Zealand is particularly well known for predator control um, because of all the predators that the seabirds face out here. And it's not just the seabirds, it's all the all the forest birds as well. Species that we don't have, like the possum and the stoat, thankfully, but also similar species like the cats and the rats. And uh, New Zealand has really been at the forefront of dealing with predator control and creating new traps and new methods, including traps and methods that we don't have access to in Hawaii. Things like good nature traps and dock 250s and the like. And then this uh, idea of a predator-free New Zealand, which is such an awesome concept. I mean, that's a, a global concept, which is a, a very worthy goal. And so we are certainly taking those things to heart back, back home, um, looking at how we can adapt these methods and traps to our own environments. These are Upper Limahuli again, um, dealing with similar species like the cats and rats, but also introduced species like mongoose. And uh, we, look to, we'll, we often look to New Zealand to look at what's, what's happening here and how we can adapt those methods to our environments and our species. Predator eradication, like I said, in uh, February I spent a couple of weeks on Haturu. It's a fantastic island. And uh, it's a real inspiration to see, you know, what can actually be done. It actually reminds me a lot, if you look at the, the picture of Haturu, it looks almost exactly like Kauai, just on a smaller scale. Um, same forests and everything. 
And uh, yet the predators have been eradicated from the site. Uh, what an achievement, it's absolutely amazing. And of course things are, um, all these different things are benefiting from it, be they this uh, cute, fluffy, adorable black petrel chick or the saddlebacks. Um, the forest is uh, you know, regenerating without the plague of things like rats. And so it's a real inspirational site which we can uh, look at and say, okay, well how can we adapt that to the Hawaiian environment? And in fact, we are currently doing that. Um, as we speak, we've had our second uh, poison drop on the island of Lehua, um, which is home to these uh, species like Bulwer's petrel and the red-tailed tropic bird, um, trying to prevent these um, birds from having the fate of that little uh, Bulwer's petrel on the top there, which has been pulled out of its burrow and eaten by a rat. And so, you know, hopefully within a couple of uh, months' time, we'll have a rat-free island there, and we can emulate the things that are going on here. Predator-proof fences, I mean, New Zealand in particular is particularly well known for predator-proof fences. Here's uh, the Tapanui fence, um, which hopefully I'll be seeing tomorrow. Um, and these, uh, the designs and all of the, um, the work that's gone into creating the perfect predator-proof fences, if you can't eradicate them from the whole area, then at least keep them out. And uh, we're taking these designs and, and using them in Hawaii as well. Uh, this is one at o in Oahu, at Kana Point to protect Lazan albatross and wedgetail shearwaters. Uh, this is one on Maui. And this is uh, one of the project that I work on on Kauai, which is an area called Nahoku. And as well as that, we're looking at how, you, how here in New Zealand you're taking these um, fences and putting them in really remote areas and incredible terrains. And that's what we're looking at now in a place like this. This is a site that we're looking at in the north of the island uh, on the Kalalau Valley. Um, and thinking of how we can create a, a New Zealand-style predator-proof fence and put it in an area like that and hopefully have a, a safe haven for the birds. And translocation projects, I mean, you know, if you can't, um, if you can't protect them where, you are, where they are, you can move them to a new area and a new um, area which is protected and then raise them there. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of translocation projects here in the Gulf, um, but there have been many of them. Um, this is one I, I undertook um, as a training exercise for me in Long Island down in the south, um, moving fluttering shearwaters um, from these areas and looking at how people monitor the burrows and how they choose the right birds. Um, getting lots of birds. This is a hundred fluttering shearwaters. We're not there yet with our birds. Um, putting them in helicopters and then flying them to their new home on Matthew Soames Island and then looking at all the husbandry that goes behind raising these birds and getting them to fledge successfully out to sea and then hopefully come back in the future. And yep, we're doing that now as well. And uh, we, we're on the third year now of a translocation project for newel shearwaters and Hawaiian petrels. Moving them from these areas, this is North Bog. Um, there's a little Hawaiian petrel wondering what I'm about to do to him. Here he is being extracted. There he is not looking happy that he's outside his burrow. <laughs> he was most displeased. Um, in his box, now happy. And uh, being carted out of the mountains and then by helicopter, whoa, ho, way. That was, and the end. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I ran out of time. Is that how you stopped me from uh, <laughs> talking any further? <laughs> Bear with us with a little technical glitch. Okay, here we go. Back on Long Island. Uh, there they are. Off they go. And here's our birds also working their way through slowly. I'm pressing the button slowly now. Uh, this was. The, yep, there we go. All right. And here, here is our um, New York shear waters, uh, in this case, being uh, measured and then put in their own uh, boxes. And then uh, we've been really successful so far. We, we're not doing the scale that you do here on New Zealand. Normally, you're doing hundreds of birds. We don't have hundreds of birds. So this year we're looking at doing uh, 20 new shear orders and 20 Hawaiian petrels. And the reason why I can't stay in New Zealand any longer than Friday is because uh, on Tuesday we'll be moving them and uh, I need to be there. So if you keep your fingers crossed for us. Social attraction projects, back to Haturu again. Um, social attraction projects also often go hand in hand with translocation projects, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you're not translocating them, you can attract them with sound. Uh, Tafanui is a good example of this, how all these new seabird species that are breeding on the site courtesy of social attraction. And in this case, we have the, um, the New Zealand storm petrel, this you know, enigmatic cryptic species um, that's now been found breeding on Haturu. And um, the social attraction site has been set up with these artificial burrows to try to attract the birds into an area where um, they can be more um, better protected and more easily studied in particular because currently they're in pretty, uh, I've been there and seen the sites they're on, they're pretty challenging to work in. And uh, you know, slowly but surely, these things are becoming successful. And this year there was a, an egg laid Unfortunately, it didn't hatch, but that's the first step, and it shows that you know, the projects like this can be successful, and they're they're on the way to working. And uh, I went there particularly thinking about the New Zealand storm petrels and how we can adapt it to Kauai with the bandrunt storm petrel, because like I said, we've got this rat eradication project going on now on Lehua, 
And we do have these little guys, the band rump storm petrel breeding there with their curiously shaped heads. Um, and uh, they're breeding there, but uh, you know, can we develop a social attraction project there? Can we use those kind of boxes and can we get the birds breeding in areas where we can uh, study them better and protect them better? And then, I mean, all you have to do is look at the, all those posters that are on the back or indeed listen to all the talks that are going on today. Um, the Horaki Gulf is a center for seabird research um, in New Zealand and around the world. Um, I, these are two maps I poached off of Matt. Um, but this is uh, work that was done on Burgess Island with the Department of Conservation and uh, New Zealand, uh, the Northern New Zealand Trust, Seabird Trust, and others. And uh, it's, you know, putting tagging devices on these species like the fluttering shearwater and the black winged petrel and seeing where they go. I mean, what do these guys do? Where do they concentrate their time? And uh, are these areas where there are potential conflicts like uh, fishing issues and bycatch, for example? And uh, particularly the black winged petrel really does kind of bring it home to me, at least. Um, that you know, your birds are also ending up in our waters. Like the black winged petrel there, we see them occasionally on Kauai. You can see their Hawaii's, I don't know if there's a pointy here, but anyway, they're up in the north um, where our, around our islands as well. And so that kind of brings it all home, you know. These birds are connected, even the, even the countries that we live in are connected by these seabirds. And um, I find that, you know, we're, we're doing similar work on Kauai with tracking devices. We've got new tracking devices, and it's always great to be able to sit down with um, particularly scientists from here um, people like Matt and Chris, and just talk about the methods that we're using, different attachment methods, different tags, bouncing ideas off each other, looking at different mapping techniques, and, uh, and taking these projects forward, because it's always good to, like I said, sharing is indeed caring. And here's some Hawaiian petrel tracks on the right-hand side of birds going in and out of their colonies, and newell shearwaters on the left as they're heading up to 400 kilometers away to, to feed. And then lastly, if you take a step back, um, you know, these, these kind of collaborations and partnerships, they lead to new horizons. And um, I was uh, thrilled to be able to go on this trip here to Papua New Guinea um, earlier this year. Um, Chris asked me if I might be interested. And as he said, I was kicking and screaming about not going. But I was like, yeah, for sure. I had to ask my wife. And she was like, it's Papua New Guinea. Yes, you can go. Um, and so we went to Papua New Guinea for two weeks um, using all of our combined expertise, all the expertise that's occurring here in the Gulf the expertise from Hawaii, um, we had um, English counterparts as well, to look for the Bex petrel. And uh, you know, it's kind of one of those epic trips that you dream of um, about before you go and you dream about afterwards. And we went on this beautiful boat and uh, used all of our combined uh, techniques to try to figure out how we could catch a Bex petrel. And if we could, because the key was to figure out where this particular species is breeding. And so we drew on all of our different uh, experiences and uh, techniques, like talking to lo the local communities, spending lots of time looking in these mist and shrouded jungles um, at night using light techniques like the, thing, the techniques that are being used on Haturu, um, countless hours bobbing around in uh, shark infested waters uh, trying to catch birds and the days drifted by and you know it was a really awesome experience but no bird was to be found and we, we, we could see them every now and then but just not quite catching them and then on the very last night that's what we got. There's Matt triumphantly holding the bird up. I could hear him in the kayak on the other side screaming and yelling. And the bird screaming and yelling, one of the most vocal birds I've ever heard. Uh, and there it is, getting the, the tag attached to it. You can see a, a very happy and extremely relieved team there that we actually had caught a bird. And there's a, a sample of the map showing where this bird is now spending a lot of its time. And you know, that wasn't possible, that kind of thing is not possible unless you have all these collaborations and partnerships. And indeed funding as well, because you can't do it without funding. And uh, now we've got to think about the next steps for this particular species, you know. If we now we know where maybe it's breeding, do we go and try to find it? I would say yes. And so just closing thoughts. Um, you know, partnerships and collaborations are vital. We're all working on similar species. We're all trying these different techniques. Um, we're trying and failing sometimes, and that's always important to know as well, you know. If you're, uh, if you're failing, then learn from mistakes. Um, seabird research here in the Gulf is world class. It's the, the forefront of seabird conservation. It really is. I'm not just saying that. I mean, it's true. If you look at all the work that's going on here, it really is um, amazing, the kind of things that are being undertaken here. Um, we're all dealing with these similar species. We're all dealing with these similar challenges. Um, the birds need our help. They really do. And um, we've got to get out there and, and do the work. We have to recognize there is this big wealth of experience. And uh, we have to adapt these existing methods to, to new environments and take all of our knowledge forward and then feed it back into the loop, because that's how we get success. And I, I don't know, I mean, I, in Hawaii, I want to see these birds persist into the future. I want my kids to be able to see them. I don't want them to disappear. 
and they're going on dangerous downward trajectories and that we need to stop that. So in closing, I'd just like to say mahalo, thank you for listening, aloha. Um, I'd like to thank all of my partners and funders, there are many, I mean there's partnerships uh, all across the Hawaiian Islands as well. Uh, I'd like to thank the Northern New Zealand Seabird Trust for inviting me to come and talk here and uh, the organizers of this, um, this meeting and the museum for this amazing auditorium and having us all here together. Um, so thank you. Thank you.